So we now know that it is not the hippocampus, like Pepez thought, but the amygdala that is critical for emotion. And much of what we know about this um, is based off of the initial work of Kluver and Busey, two psychological surgeons that reported their findings in 1939. And what they did in this particular uh, research was basically performing an anterior temporal lobectomy uh, in monkeys. Um, and that did include the amygdala. And so Kluver and Busey reported that generally there was a decreased fear response. But interestingly enough, this led to a loss of social position in monkeys. And you might actually be kind of surprised by that because if they're not afraid, if an alpha monkey tries to challenge them, you would think that the monkey uh, with the damage would not be afraid of that. The problem is that even though there is a decreased fear response in their, these monkeys, they are also less aggressive. They're less likely to fight. They're less likely to be defensive. And because of that, these monkeys will lose social position as a result. Um, they also engaged in um, hypersexuality. Um, they displayed having some visual agnosia, which makes sense given that part of the inferior temporal cortex was damaged. And they also engaged in what is called hyperorality, um, basically exploring objects with the mouth, which given that visual agnosia happens, makes sense. If you can't recognize an object by sight, you could probably put it in your mouth and figure out what it is. Now, this I'm a little less okay with it turns out that Kluver and Busey also performed amygdaladectomies on, um, pre on prisoners. That I feel less comfortable with. Um, but generally, regardless of where Kluver and Busey obtained their findings, they did show that regions beyond the hippocampus, uh, the amygdala in particular, are associated with emotions. And this includes not only fear, but also aggression, as well as mating type behavior. So what does this look like in humans? Um, typically, we will find a very similar syndrome uh, when the brain, uh, particularly the amygdala, is damaged. And the amygdala is really the key structure that has to be damaged to basically create this. Um, so there will be decreased fear in addition to anger. Uh, potentially oppositional defiant disorder. Um, this is typically diagnosed in children, but it also can be found uh, in adults with amygdala damage. So these people will often have uh, display defiance, have tantrums, be very irritable. Again, um, you will see that hypersexuality, but they typically uh, will not be aggressive in that hypersexuality. Um, so you won't necessarily see these people going out and assaulting others others, um, they may just really like to engage in things like masturbation uh, due to that hypersexuality. Um, they will have a visual agnosia once again because of damage to the inferior temporal lobe, and they may also choose to engage in hyperorality because of that agnosia. Um, so this is very similar to what we see in primates. So based on Kluver and Busey's work, Paul McLean, um, a neurologist, basically updated um, the limbic system to include the amygdala into that Pepez circuit. Um, and so this is, uh, at least according to McLean, a phylogenetically old system buried under the cortex. So phylogenetically, our cortex is pretty new. Um, phylogenetically speaking, uh, our limbic system is a little bit older. Um, so his view of the limbic system is basically all of the areas I mentioned in the Pepez circuit along with the amygdala. Um, and this is a system of emotion and declarative memory. Um, the hypothalamus may also potentially be involved. Um, the hypothalamus contributes to um, these different behaviors through hormonal regulation. And as we discussed before, uh, the amygdala does project to numerous regions that can produce many neurotransmitters involved in these behaviors. And I'll show you what some of those different projections are in just a second. 
So here as of 1952 is our updated limbic system. So we have our mammillary bodies, our hippocampus, our amygdala, our fornix, our cingulate cortex, and our interior thalamus of our, our interior nucleus of the thalamus. So as I mentioned, uh, the amygdala has um, a lot of different outputs from its central nucleus. So the amygdala projects to a wide variety of places, and all of these outputs mediate various aspects of emotional responses. Um, so, for example, it projects to the lateral hypothalamus, so we get sympathetic activation, uh, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, so we get parasympathetic um, activation, the parabrachial nucleus, we get more respiration, VTA, we get dopamine increases, the locus coeruleus, we get norepinephrine, so increased vigilance, the dorsal lateral tagmental nucleus, we get increased cortical cortical activation through acetylcholine, the nucleus reticularis pontus caudalis, um, that's a startle response, the periaqueductal gray, which we'll talk about eventually, that produces freezing behaviors, cranial nerves that produce facial expressions of fear, the paraventricular nucleus, which secretes ACTH and glucocorticoids to uh, manage stress responses, and the nucleus basalis, which, or the basal nucleus, which also activates the cortex. So this is part of the reason why damage to the amygdala produces so many different emotional changes. But for right now, we're going to focus on fear. The amygdala has been shown to be critical for processing fear and the different emotional and physical behaviors that are associated with fear. Uh, this largely comes from evidence from patients and monkeys with Kluver-Busey syndrome, as well as those that have more focal amygdala damage. Typically, we will we'll find that these patients uh, do not demonstrate a fear response. They don't flinch, they don't startle, they don't freeze, and they don't widen their eyes. Um, and adi in addition to this, the fear conditioning experiments that we talked about previously uh, last week and imaging studies in humans have also shown the role that the amygdala plays in fear. So if we want to look at amygdala research in humans, there are a couple of different things that we can do. Um, typically, we do find that if we stimulate the amygdala, it produces a fear response and the emotion of fear. Um, this largely comes from work involved with intractable epileptics. Um, we can actually stimulate brain regions near the area that's about to be removed. So we want to kind of keep the amygdala, and we know that when you stimulate it, this is what happens. Um, in addition, we can look at imaging studies. So we can put people in an fMRI scanner, expose them to fearful or non-fearful stimuli, and uh, basically see how the amygdala changes in terms of its activation. And we do show that the amygdala tends to be more active during the viewing of negative emotional stimuli than neutral stimuli. In addition, we do know that um, fear responses that involve the amygdala also will include an increased heart and respiration rate, pupil dilation, and heightened blood pressure due to that sympathetic system activation. So interestingly enough, here, if, here is a case where we present people with various type of words. Some of these words have negative emotional content, others do not. So words like slaughter, danger, murder are basically interpolated with words like bookcase, dial, and wheel. And what we tend to find is that in general, when presented with these negative emotional words, um, the amygdala tends to show heightened activation compared to when neutral words are viewed. So here's what's interesting. This doesn't just happen for words. Um, this also happens for negative images, negative sounds, uh, negative stories. And it's not just a, a fear output response. It's also interpreting negative stimuli, uh, both understanding and the behavioral response appropriate for that negative stimulus. So here's another case with negative pictures. So here we have a tarantula on your shoulder. Uh, that might be pretty negative for some people. Somebody looking out a window, that's pretty neutral. Here's a dog that looks very angry. 
So both of these are going to lead to heightened activation in the amygdala relative to more neutral pictures. So what this kind of tells us is that people tend to remember negative information better than they remember neutral information. And in general, what we find is that negative emotion will enhance declarative memory. We have a negativity bias. People tend to report better memory and more detailed memory for negative emotional events than neutral ones. Um, negative events tend to be better remembered. And part of the reason for this is that the amygdala activation is positively positively correlated with memory. Generally, the more active it is, the better your memory for that thing is. And we know that the amygdala activation tends to be greatest for negative stimuli. Part of the reason that this happens is because emotional stimuli, especially if it's negative, are typically more engaging they draw your attention more and they enhance your memory as a result. This has a lot of different effects on neurotransmitter systems like norepinephrine. It generally stimulates the brain and that works to produce a longer lasting memory as a result. And in fact, this close connection between the amygdala located right here and the hippocampus, which is directly posterior to it, explains why negative events tend to be better remembered than neutral ones. Um, this explains the emotional enhancement for declarative memory. Generally, more emotional memories are better remembered than non-emotional memories. And we know that the hippocampus is necessary for forming these new declarative memories. This close connection might explain why emotions often enhance memory. So one of the other things that we find, in addition to the research we've already discussed, the amygdala is also really important for processing the emotional expression of faces. Generally, the amygdala is more active during viewing fearful than happy faces, even if you're not consciously aware of it. Now here's a case where we're looking at two different faces, and it's very, very clear and very, very conscious to people that the bottom bottom face is fearful. And as we will see for conscious stimuli, the amygdala will be more active for a fearful face. But this even happens when uh, stimuli are not consciously perceived. So here we are looking at two different faces, a neutral face and a fearful face. And here um, we've modified the spatial frequencies. So here we've removed the lower spatial frequencies and we're only looking at the high frequencies. Here we keep the low spatial frequencies and remove the high spatial frequencies of the image. So it's very, very difficult to actually determine the uh, emotional expression for both of the stimuli. So it makes it difficult to consciously perceive the expression. And despite all of this, the amygdala is still more responsive to this negative face than to this neutral one. So why is the amygdala so responsive to fearful faces, even though we necessarily can't consciously perceive that these faces are fearful? Um, before we do move on, here is the uh, data kind of showing that there is enhanced amygdala activation in the left and right amygdala for those fearful faces only when operating on lower spatial frequencies. So part of the reason that this happens is because of our visual pathway. Remember that not all visual information from the retina goes to the primary visual cortex for conscious perception. Do remember that there are areas, um, we have connections to the thalamus as well as the superior colliculus. Um, and because of that, um, the thalamus has connections to areas like the brainstem and then the cortex. Um, and then these areas will also have contact with the amygdala. So even if you can't consciously perceive a stimulus, outputs from the thalamus can project to the amygdala and thus you're still getting that activation enhancement for negative stimuli, even if you can't consciously perceive it. 
So the amygdala actually gets input from all of the different sensory cortexes. So here's our thalamus, here's the sensory corte cortices. So that includes uh, V1 and the extra striate cortex. That includes A1 and the uh, extra auditory cortices, uh, the primary somatosensory cortex and surrounding areas. And um, so the amygdala gets that. It also gets information from the sensory nuclei of the thalamus, areas like the pulvinar, the lateral geniculate nucleus for, um, for um, visual information, the medial geniculate nucleus for auditory information, and so on. And this means that some sensory information that reaches the amygdala is not consciously perceived. Um, you can't have conscious perception at the thalamic level. So if the thalamus is projecting to the amygdala, that means not all of it will be perceived. Since visual information is constructed in the cortex, low level sensory information from the thalamus that enters the amygdala is lower resolution. And this explains why the amygdala can even respond to that lower level stimuli. Now this kind of low level input that is also fast is is going to be really important for registering fear responses uh, in situations where this might be beneficial. So for animals that might be dealing with a predator. Now let's talk a little bit more about uh, amygdala damage in humans and what this produces. Now given what we know about the amygdala's role in processing negative stimuli, many of these will make sense. So we do find that for people that have amygdala damage, they will typically have no enhancement for negative stimuli. So their memory for negative information will not be uh, prioritized or advantaged like it is in uh, humans without amygdala damage. Um, they actually have impaired recognition of scary music, but not music that's happy or sad. Um, generally, memory for negative details of a story will not be enhanced in amygdala patients. Um, they will display some cute Kluver Busey aspects, um, decreased fear, um, oppositional defiant disorder, hypersexuality, but no agnosia. The agnosia that's associated with Kluver Busey is from inferior temporal cortex damage, not amygdala damage. So if if the inferior temporal cortex isn't damaged, you won't have agnosia. And you will also have impaired recognition of fearful faces. So something that's kind of cool is that patients with bilateral amygdala damage don't actually spend as much time looking at the eyes of any face, including fearful ones. Um, but as we know, one of the best ways that we can figure out is if a face is fearful is by looking at the whites of the eyes. Generally, fearful faces tend to show more white. This is the most important feature for perceiving fear. Other areas like the mouth are more important for things like happiness or disgust. And without looking at the eyes, the patient will not perceive the fearful expression. Um, so interestingly enough, um, some patients can be directed to attend to the eyes and perceive fear, but generally people with amygdala damage will have trouble interpreting expressions, particularly if they're negative. So take a look. Here we have a control person. You see that in all of these cases, their eyes are constantly in the shape of a triangle, um, especially focusing on the eyes. Notice in contrast that a patient that's had the amygdala removed is typically going to spend more time focusing on the nose and mouth rather than the eyes. So let's talk a little bit about some of the different ways that the amygdala can be damaged. And one of the major ways that the amygdala gets damaged is basically because of the design of our skull. Um, there are vulnerable points where the brain actually sits near bony ridges, such as this one, or this one, or this one. And because of that, that makes certain areas of the brain more susceptible to damage. As you can see, the inside of the skull is not smooth. It is made up of sutures of bone that have been fused together. So the inside can be quite jagged.
Um, so in particular, uh, this can happen because of a uh, bilateral temporal contusion. A contusion is like a bruise, so your brain can basically be bruised. And because the amygdala kind of sits near those vulnerable points of that skull, they are more likely to be damaged. Um, here, this is going to lead to damage to more than just the amygdala. This can happen because of an accident or because of a fall. Um, here's kind of another example here. We've got bilateral traumatic damage. This side definitely got it a lot more worse than the other one. Here's kind of another view of that. So you can kind of see the areas. Um, so we're kind of looking at a uh, lower view of the brain. Here's a ventral view. Here's the cerebellum. You can kind of see that again, um, Damage near those vulnerable points leads to blood coming into contact with the brain and thus producing bilateral amygdala damage. You can kind of see uh, that here as well. Uh, another case where herpes encephalitis can also uh, damage the brain, it can also cause anterograde uh, memory loss. Um, another one that actually leads to amygdala damage is frontotemporal dementia. This is a type of dementia that we'll kind of talk about later. Um, this is associated with a lot of atrophy beyond the amygdala. Um, and generally here, patients with this disorder will demonstrate impaired fear perception, impaired expression of fear, and memory in and impaired memory enhancement for negative stimuli. And we'll kind of talk about this more when we talk about aging at the end of the semester. Now, so the amygdala plays a huge role in fear. It also plays a huge role in aggression, and this is moderated by the effect of testosterone. So we're gonna talk about these and kind of close out this lecture with a discussion of aggression, the amygdala, and the role that testosterone plays. So as I kind of mentioned before, the amygdala has so many different outputs to the brain um, that are basically designed for different behavioral responses, like fear-based responses. They do also engage in uh, aggressive responses, whether that is defensive to protect oneself or predatory. Um, generally, aggressive behaviors are species stereotypical and they are instinctive. So if my cat is feeling threatened, a very species specific thing that a small cat will do, it'll arch its back to try to make itself look big, it will hiss, and so on. Um, and an area that seems to be really important for aggressive behaviors are the outputs that the amygdala has to the periaqueductal gray matter. This area has a lot of connections to motor neurons, and as such, it helps mediate different behaviors that you would expect with aggression, including both defensive aggression and predatory aggression. So again, um, let's kind of focus on some of the different outputs uh, from the amygdala to other parts of the brain that mediate aggressive behaviors. Uh, this will, uh, sympathetic activation to the um, hypothalamus will play a role. Uh, that will mean more norepinephrine due to uh, the locus coeruleus. That enhances sympathetic activity. It increases blood flow to muscles. It excites the brain. It creates energy. So the amygdala not only has a lot of outputs for mediating fear responses, it also has a lot of outputs for mediating aggressive responses. So let's briefly talk about the difference between defensive and predatory aggression. So the dorsal periaqueductal gray um, is basically um, for defensive aggression. So the goal of defensive aggression is to protect oneself. So you're going to try to make yourself look larger, hair might stand up on end, uh, the animal might growl, the animal might hiss. Um, and we do find that if you stimulate parts of the periaqueductal periaqueductal gray, you will actually see these behaviors. Now, if we're focusing on the ventral periaqueductal gray, 
Um, we will see predatory aggressive behaviors. So this is, these are aggressive behaviors that predators will do to try to get their prey. They will stalk their prey. They will try to be stealthy and they will creep along slowly. So if you've ever seen my dog try to chase after a squirrel, he moves very quietly and slowly. And that is predatory aggression. Now, damage to the amygdala will produce a loss of social position like we saw in Kluver Busey because the animal does not respond appropriately to threatening situations or challenges from other animals. And it's also because they are no longer aggressive. If the amygdala is damaged, it cannot make outputs to the periaqueductal gray to mediate these different behaviors. Um, in addition to this, so here's kind of a mapping of our periaqueductal gray. So here is our amygdala that has outputs to uh, the ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus. So that will help mediate some sympathetic nervous system behaviors. These will both send outputs to the periaqueductal gray. Those will make contact with the corticospinal tract and provide output to muscles to engage in defensive and predatory behaviors. So here, we have male seal elephants engaged in defensive aggressive displays. They're trying to make themselves look big. Here is a case where we see defensive aggression in a cat. It's arching its back, trying to make itself look big and possibly trying to hiss. And then here, we have an instance of predatory aggression. This tiger is stalking and creeping and trying to be as quiet as possible so that it can reach its prey. So let's talk a little bit about the different relationships between the amygdala, the periaqueductal gray, and the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus, which is located right here, is going to release a hormone that will stimulate other hormone release in the periaqueductal gray to help stimulate blood flow, increase respiration, and heart rate to either engage in defensive or predatory aggression. The amygdala is going to receive a lot of sensory information and it has to be able to respond appropriately to that. Now, sometimes it's gonna be defensive, so we're gonna need the dorsal periaqueductal gray. Sometimes it's gonna be predatory, so we're gonna need the ventral periaqueductal gray. Um, this is a very, very important connection because the goal is to interpret the stimulus and mediate the correct response. Am I looking at something to eat? Or am I looking at something to fight? Am I looking at something that wants to eat me? Is it scary? So we have to be able to mediate these different behaviors. So how does testosterone play a role in all of this? So testosterone is the principal male sex steroid hormone. It is present in females, but to a lesser degree. Uh, it's produced both by the testes in males and the ovaries in females. Some can be released uh, by the adrenal gland. Generally, the blood concentration of testosterone in males is about 40 to 60 times that that we would see in females. So there's a very well-established link between testosterone and aggression. Uh, we do tend to, and I would say that a lot of these are correlational in nature. Take them with a huge grain of salt. We tend to find that there's higher blood concentration in violent criminals. Um, it also tends to be higher in people rated as aggressive by their peers or people who have acted more aggressively. We tend to find that it's higher in male athletes prior to competition, and it's also higher in winners and fans of winners. So when the St. Louis Blues won the Stanley Cup last year, fans of the team probably temporarily experienced a heightened testosterone concentration. So um, testosterone has numerous effects on the body. It does uh, also enhance neurotransmitters that are associated with excitation. So testosterone increases things like blood flow, muscle contraction, uh, and muscle strength, and the hormones involved in mating too. So it also increases excitation of the limbic circuit, and all of this could enhance aggressive displays.
There's also evidence of this in uh, non-human animals too. So what you're looking at here is data from um, data from overectomized uh, rats. So these are female rats that have basically had their ovaries removed. And depending on the group of rats, they were injected with a different substance. They were either injected with estradiol, which is a precursor to estrogen, the female sex hormone. Uh, they were injected with testosterone or they were injected with a placebo. So what you're looking at here on your y-axis is the frequency of inner female aggression and fighting. And generally what you can see is that the female rats that were injected with testosterone were far more likely to engage in aggressive behaviors with other female rats than the rats that were injected with the estrogen precursor or a placebo. Now here's another study that actually shows how alcohol actually modifies the effect of testosterone on aggression. So generally, we're going to look at two groups of monkeys during two different periods of time. So we have dominant monkeys, which generally will tend to have higher circulating testosterone, and you'll have subordinate monkeys that don't. You will also have mating season where circulating testosterone tends to be higher and non-mating season where it tends to be lower. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting, we have so we have our controls, we have those monkeys that were given alcohol. And as you can kind of see, alcohol increases attacks and displays of aggression particularly by dominant monkeys. You don't really see this as much with subordinates. You see this more in dominant monkeys against subordinates. And so this suggests that alcohol enhances the aggressive inducing effect of testosterone. Alcohol also seems to increase aggressive behaviors uh, in humans, particularly in men. Now, some of that could be that men are often socialized to show anger, whereas women typically are socialized that anger is not something that a woman should display. Um, but we also know that alcohol um, can act to release areas of the brain like the amygdala from inhibition. Alcohol in general loosens your inhibitions. And so because of that, it's going to disinhibit the amygdala, disinhibit those tendencies towards aggressive displays. So one of the ways that you can kind of see this is uh, this was a very famous case. In 2008, the San Francisco Giants won the World Series for the first time in a very, very long time. And here's what happened after. So oftentimes we will find that winners and fans of winners will have higher circulating uh, testosterone. Also add to the fact that pro probably quite a few people were drinking. This is going to increase the likelihood of aggression and aggressive displays. So that's really all I had for you uh, for this week. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, we will talk some more about uh, emotion and the limbic system next week. Take care.